Dr. Mark Mitchell teaches political theory and serves as the chairman of the Department of Government, uh, which he did for many years prior to accepting his current role as the Dean of Academic Affairs here at PHC. He is the author of a lot of books, including The Limits of Liberalism, The Politics of Gratitude, and here's my personal favorite title, Plutocratic Socialism, The Future of Private Property and the Fate of the Middle Class. He is co-founder and president of the Front Porch Republic, which publishes articles on scale, place, self-government, sustainability, and limits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Mitchell. Thank you, Jack, and um, it's good to see you all again. I have to admit that I'm a little bit nervous um, because some of you have already heard me talk a fair amount today, and, and there's something called overexposure, and I worry that we might be reaching the limit. And so this will, I'm gonna, I promised uh, that I would keep this under an hour. <laughs> which is not a lot since my typical classroom is 90, and class is 90 minutes. So this is gonna be um, a breeze. It's good to see you all here. And tonight I, I, I've, I've titled this talk, Strange Fire and the Light of the World. Three centuries before the birth of Christ, Plato, wrote a fable. It was an allegory. It's part of a larger project that we know as his Republic. And about two-thirds of the way through the book, he tells a story, and many of you are familiar with this. He tells the story of a cave, and there are people down at the bottom of the cave chained to a bench, and all they can see is the shadows being cast on the wall of the cave. And Plato imagines that up behind those people chained to that bench is a fire burning. And that fire is casting light, that is creating shadows on the back wall of the cave. But farther up and out of the cave shines the sun. And for Plato, this allegory is one that describes the human condition and also reality itself. For that fire that's burning behind our cave dwellers is our sun. It's the visible world inside the cave, but outside the cave, according to Plato, is what he calls the intelligible world. And the sun that is burning there is not the physical sun of our material world, but he calls the good. And he imagines these cave dwellers being released from their bonds and turning around and seeing things as they are. And Plato recognizes something that Paul recognizes as well. That is to say, the things that are seen are temporal, but things that are unseen are eternal. He understood that true wisdom is seeing the sun, that sun outside of the cave, this thing that he calls the good, as the source of all things. And although Plato didn't have the scriptures, he grasped an important truth. There is a light that is worthy of our ultimate attention. And it's perfectly reasonable to sacrifice everything to attain it. It is that, that, that thing that Christ called the pearl of great price. However, we also know something from this story. That is, if those cave dwellers stopped at that, that fire that was burning behind them, if they stopped their upward ascent there, and concluded that that fire was the ultimate source of reality, they would have been guilty of folly. Indeed, they might even have been tempted to worship it if they thought it the ultimate source of reality, which is to say, 
all human beings suffer from a perennial temptation to idolatry. This is true because of the kind of creatures we are. We are lovers who worship, which is to say, you will love. You will worship. The question is what or who will you love? What or who will you worship? Plato's allegory discloses some important truths. First, there is a light that is the source of all, and finding that light and attending to it properly is inseparable from wisdom, from health, from sanity. And second, there are counterfeit lights that tempt us, that seek to steal our attention and even to steal our worship. But they do not lead to wisdom. In fact, they lead to misery, enslavement, and death. Of course, the theme of light permeates the scriptures. The very first discreet act of God is uttering the words, let there be light. Of course, Christ is described as the light of the world. But scripture also talks about bad light, false light, light that appears to disclose truth, but in actuality deceives. Or to put matters slightly differently, there is a fire that is holy, and there is what the King James Version calls strange fire. The term comes from Leviticus chapter 10. Many of you know the story where Nadab and Abihu, the wicked sons of Aaron, offered up strange fire to the Lord. The Hebrew word here is zara. We translate it as unauthorized, foreign, or profane. It's the same word, incidentally, that's used for prostitute. And there are some examples in Scripture that I'd like to highlight. First from Genesis chapter 3. It's the original temptation. The serpent in the garden promised that their eyes would be open, which is to say not clouded in darkness. They would know good from evil. And this is an important point, or important point. Knowledge and light go together. But the problem with this original sin is that they sought knowledge, they sought enlightenment apart from God. It was a kind of autonomous seeking. And this provides an important reminder for an educational institution. Knowledge sought apart from God is false light. It is darkness masquerading as light. It is strange fire. Second passage, Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel story. The people of Babel sought to build a city and a tower to, as they put it, make a name for themselves. And there's an interesting detail included in the text. They used bricks and mortar. Bricks made of dirt. The very stuff from which God made the first man. But instead of breathing into that dirt the breath of life, they put it to fire and made bricks. It's a kind of technology. A technology made possible by fire that, like all technologies, amplified their power and made it possible for them to aspire to rival God. So another principle, power sought apart from submission to God is strange fire that results in God's judgment. Third, consider the biblical name of Satan, Lucifer. It literally means light bringer. He is an angel of light who is at the same time the father of lies. 
And Jesus says something remarkable when he's describing Satan. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So here we have in this metaphor that Satan is, or that Jesus is using, describing Satan as this falling lightning, we have a, the, the, the notions of light, of fire, and deception all rolled up into one. Consider our world today. For the first time in human history, it's now possible to imagine a completely unified world. And the unification is made possible by a kind of strange fire. And there's something significant about this fire. Unlike the Promethean fire stolen from the gods in the ancient myths, our strange fire ostensibly is the work of our own hands. Consider this. This is what Lenin said about the project to electrify Russia. That is to bring electricity to Russia. He said, let the peasant pray to electricity. He is going to feel the power of the central authorities more than that of heaven. The candles of the church were replaced by the artificial light made possible by a state that claimed absolute power over the people and claimed to be the source of this new light. Now, of course, fire itself isn't the problem. Electricity isn't the problem. The fire casting shadows in Plato's cave, it's not the problem. The problem emerges when we mistake profane fire for the sacred and treat it as such. Today we can create a world in which the sacred light of God is at least apparently overshadowed by the strange fires of our own creation. For instance, it's possible to create a city that never sleeps and we can even write songs about it. But in a city that never sleeps, the heavenly hosts are never seen. And the works of man's hands are all that one experiences. But if, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, what happens when we no longer gaze into the heavens? What happens when the night sky is obliterated by the lights of our own ingenuity? We have created a world in which Creatures created in God's image are increasingly hunched over digital screens illuminated by a light that promises access to the complete store of human knowledge. In other words, a Google search promises very much the same thing that the serpent promised in the garden. You will be wise. A visitor from another world might be forgiven for concluding that human beings worship light emanating from the devices around which we increasingly organize our lives. One contemporary writer put it this way, the serpent has unwound himself from the tree and curled up behind our screens and none of us are able to turn our gaze away. We live in a technological society. And again, technology per se is not the problem. Humans are creators. We are makers who imitate God who is the original maker. However, while humans have always developed technologies, not all societies are technological societies. The difference I would submit is this. In a technological society, people are inclined to love, serve, and even tempted to worship their technologies. Where in a non-technological society, people love, serve, and worship something other than human creation. In other words, technological societies worship strange fire. Jesus said this. He said, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. This applies not just to individuals, but to societies and to nations. And Lucifer is a light that is darkness. 
Venerating a rainbow stripped from God's promises and commands is a light that is darkness. Claiming freedom apart from the limits of God's created order is a light that is darkness. Imagining it possible to create an artificial intelligence that has all of the qualities of the image bearers of God is a light that is darkness. And here's the challenge. How do we construct our lives so that we serve, love, and worship the true light, the true light of the world, who is Christ, rather than succumb to the temptation, which is a very real one, to order our lives around strange fire that has seduced and is consuming our society and the world as a whole. And here's an irony. Our world is more full of light than ever before. But darkness prevails. Why? It's because we're worshiping strange fire that promises illumination and enlightenment but only brings darkness, chaos, and confusion. We need to hear once again the words uttered by God at the very beginning, let there be light. For true light is the remedy to chaos and confusion. Now it's important to realize that light in this regard is not simply or even primarily a material notion. That is, it's a wave or a particle. To think in these terms is to think like a materialist. And the true meaning of light is obscured. Light is the embodiment of order, of intelligibility, of rationality of ordered hierarchy. Ultimately, it is as Dante put it, the love that moves the sun in heaven and all the stars. And this light was made incarnate when Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took on flesh. With the incarnation, the light became visible, became present to us. The goodness of embodied created order was decisively ratified in that moment. It should be no surprise then that Lucifer, the false light, would seek to undermine the goodness of the incarnation and of embodiment in general. One scholar, social scientist, has found that, quote, extremely online behavior is correlated with abandoning religious commitment and practices. This shouldn't be surprising. It really is a manifestation of an ancient heresy. It's a new form of Gnosticism, which is to say an old religious form in new technological garb. For of course, and I think this is an important point, there is no secularism. There is only worship. You will worship fire, the holy fire of the triune God, or strange fire. We are lovers and worshipers. Worshipers will worship. The Gospel of John tells us, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. He is the true light that gives light to the world. What does true light do? It illuminates, it discloses, it reveals that which is. And this, I think, provides a kind of uh, ironic moment. When we call a whole historical movement the Enlightenment, and so much of it is characterized by a, a seeking out of autonomous, light apart from submission to Christ who is the only true light. In the fourth century, the great church father Augustine wrote a short dialogue called The Teacher. And in that dialogue, he argues that all knowing is the product of illumination. But We don't have the light in ourselves. Thus, we need 
an outside light. And for Augustine, Christ is that light. Christ is the teacher, for he is the light of the world. And therefore, according to Augustine, all knowing is made possible by the illumination of Christ. In this respect, all knowing is in fact revelation. It's revealed by virtue of the goodness of the teacher, who is Christ. Even non-believers, insofar as they truly know something, according to Augustine, know because of the grace of the teacher. There is no such thing as secular knowing that is true knowing. It is all rooted ultimately in Christ. And depending on another source of light, another source of illumination is to rely on strange fire that leads to error, confusion, and death. Now, of course, with all of that, Christ makes an astonishing claim. He tells the disciples, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You hear the dynamic? Do you see what's going on? Christ is the light of the world. He is the giver of all. And his disciples, we, his disciples, are to bear his light as reflections of his truth to a world darkened by the deceptions of the angel of light. But of course, our light is not autonomous. We don't generate it ourselves. It's not our light. But it's light that is reflected from Christ so that God is glorified as the ultimate source of light where truth, goodness, and beauty reside in eternal perfection. John tells us that God is light and we are commanded to walk in the light. This requires that we submit to the light and it's only in this posture of submission of humility, that we can acquire the knowledge that is not strange fire, that leads to confusion and death. Here at PHC, we're committed to ordering our endeavors around the true light, which gives light to all the world. And in this regard, it's crucial to understand that education is not simply or even primarily about information. Education is primarily and unavoidably about formation. It's about forming habits, forming loves, forming a disposition to serve. And the key question that has to be asked is, what habits will you cultivate? What or who will you love? Who or what will you serve? Because again, you are lovers, you are worshipers, and you will love you will worship either the fire of God's holiness or a counterfeit. And so I would encourage you freshmen, take seriously your calling to be a student. Put away childish things. Stop flirting with the strange fires that our society sets up to rival the true light. You cannot serve two masters. Don't even try. Make it a priority. Dedicate yourselves to seeking diligently the true light that gives light to the world. May we order our lives as the psalmist describes who wrote, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Welcome to PHC. As you embark on this college career, may God richly bless you with the true enlightenment that is only found in Christ, the one who lives in the holiness of perpetual life.